let's take a look at this story of a simple engineer, or if you want to give me a title, what kind of engineer, you can call me non-aligned engineer. Um, the non-aligned part comes from this non-aligned place uh, where um, I was born, it's, it's called Yugoslavia. Uh, it was a non-aligned place because it was a place beyond uh, and between, in a sense, different kinds of blocks, political blocks. But it's also a place where I have learned to think exactly without blocks on my head, um, or to sort of switch blocks on my head, and so on. Um, so I'm in a sense still benefiting from that uh, path dependence uh, itself. But then my path took me uh, to US. Uh, this, is, this is still me, a uh, little bit, um, now, now I have a little bit more gray hair and a few more, few more kilos, but that's, that's still me uh, tinkering with, uh, with the device. This is a traffic light controller. That's what changes the, the red, green, yellow lights uh, when you don't sort of, uh, you know, look. Um, so as it usually goes, when technology doesn't work, it kind of comes into being. That's what philosophers usually say. Um, and this device came into being because it didn't want to work. It didn't want to talk to my com computer uh, where I was trying to run some simulations. And that started sort of bu bugging me. And I was like, what, what, what is technology at all? That was the, sort of the, the question that kind of triggered this whole, this whole process. But of course, that's a very big question. And you can't just answer that. You have to start somewhere, and I, my intuitive uh, sort of path was like, let's look at history. Let's look at the path of how did I end up dealing with this device in the first place. I mean, so then kind of a bit more fast forward. Um, this is a picture from Brussels, uh, Schumann area, if you have ever seen that. Not a very human-centered or any life-centered environment, but that's exactly where European Commission is. And uh, through my work uh, for them, I kind of realized that also trying to sort of answer some of these fundamental questions, we have a very shallow theory of technology for this field uh, called transport engineering. And well, my, one, might, one might speculate why. So one reason could be simply that, that uh, the field came after the technologies were, in a sense, invented. Yeah, A lot of urban transport technologies are already they have origins in the, in the 19th century. Yeah? So even electric scooters that are annoying you, like will annoy you in the summer, uh, some of you have been uh, there in the 19th, 19th uh, century. So then, um, what is, I mean, trying to kind of unpack this sort of theory of technology, I was, I was kind of like, uh, uh, when I saw this, this, this picture, it's called Science, Science on the March, it was exactly sort of describing what is the status of this uh, theory of technology. So it has two fundamental uh, premises built in inside. Uh, one is that when we say technology, we usually mean functional tools. Like that's what usually you imagine. Like they have function, there are sort of tools. And the other one is that there is some kind of linear progress. There are sort of clear linear pathways, and 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 we always get from from worse past into better future. Yeah. And that might be true uh, to, to some extent, um, but then we all kind of intuitively know that technologies also have very oftentimes negative consequences for us, yeah? And I'm not the first one to think about that. Many people have thought about that, the same thing. So even something benevolent as the railroad, you know, people like trains and so on, um, uh, it might actually, in a sense, ride upon us. We, we know that technologies have negative uh, consequences and even this thing that most of you nowadays have in your pockets, which is also some kind of mobility technology, you know it, that it's, I mean, is it really just good? Like, is it just doing you good all the time? You kind of know it, that it's the, the answer to that question, yeah? Um, so that, that's one side of this uh, story. The other side is, we also know that we, we actually have to, or we, we usually end up reshaping society to actually fit technology. Like, that always happens, like, um, we, everybody, in a sense, intuitively understands it, but then only when we actually start doing it, then we realize that. So, um, like la last summer, when we had to introduce rules for these very electric scooters in, in Helsinki region, because there were just too many accidents uh, happening. And um, so that was sort of, you, you had to introduce how, how people should behave. That's very much constructing society. So, um, 
in a sense, if you sort of go back to kind of the fundamentals and what I have learned from a, a range of disciplines actually studying technology, um, we have to sort of switch from this um, uh, perspective to kind of accepting the fact that the path of technology is nonlinear. Yeah? And that's, that's a fundamental thing in itself to kind of uh, accept. And then the fact is, well, it's nonlinear and then it's dynamic. The dynamics is that you have this co-construction of technology and society. Yeah, they're sort of in, in, in very fuzzy interplay of what, uh, what actually happens. So, so then if, if you accept this dynamics and the path, uh, is it really just tools and progress? I mean, maybe it's tools and progress, but there is maybe something else. And let's claim, for the sake of the argument, let's just say that this is also ideology. And now you're sort of like, okay, what do you mean? Yeah. Well, ideas. I mean, basically, technology has ideas built into it, and it ends up usually actually shaping our ideas. I mean, so, so it's not just about direct physical harm that you fall down with an electric scooter, and now we take you to the hospital, but it also does to something that we have very sort of implicit to our world of ideas. Yeah? So it sort of changes that. And maybe in the long term, that matters quite a lot if you sort of change ideas over time. So let's, let's take an example. Uh, so this is, this is a snippet from um, one of the German documents um, uh, coming from Federal Ministry of Transport and Digital Infrastructure. And if you sort of read this text, it has a lot of values and assumptions, even this small piece, not even the whole document. So it is about some kind of pride, history, sort of. The, the car was invented in Germany. And we will do it again, yeah, if it need be. And then there is sort of something about the game. We're still at the top of the international league. So, so this is about competition as well, yeah? So pride, competition, these are certain values that are sort of put forward. And then some other values go to the back of the list. Um, a similar kind of a document that about the same time, a couple of years ago, from the Finnish Ministry of Transport and Communications, tells us that there is sort of Determinism. The future will be like this, uh, certainty, determinism, and then there is also this sort of call to reason at the same time. Yeah? Uh, so you can, you can start to see that there are a lot of these, these sorts of values and assumptions built into the discourse <coughs> itself. And then, it, of course, usually it follows, the, the discourse sort of carves the path for the technology itself. But usually we start with this uh, sort of discursive uh, move. So this is uh, some kind of engineering as well, yeah. Uh, so then if you sort of as accept this uh, previous part, my immediate question when I, when I sort of realized the previous part, I was kind of like, well then who actually decides about these values and assumptions? Um, yeah, so like usually we say we, yeah, like that figure that I so showed you, society and technology, it sounds like we are constructing or the society is doing something, but um, Maybe not, yeah? And actually, um, it has this one sign is just, it's so, in so few words, it says so much about uh, our values and assumptions that have a lot to do with um, parking and, and men and so on. We don't have to go in, in, into that whole thing. Um, uh, but we have to sort of accept that we're, we're still in this, uh, we're, we have this relationship with technology that we allow the few to shape the path of technology. Yeah? And if you want an example from the present day, you, I mean, you can of course go to Henry Ford yeah? uh, and his own values, uh, if you ever want to read about values of that person. But uh, I mean, in, in our everyday life, it's Elon Musk. I mean, that's a, a clearly a person who is sort of trying to tell us, all of us, seven billion people, what the transport future should be, yeah? uh, in a sense. And um, why are we listening to him? Yeah? So it's not just that kind of we end up with that, but I'm afraid that this we just end up with very bad engineering. And I don't want to be a bad engineer, to be honestly speaking about this. Uh, so I don't think we are kind of at this stage anymore where we just should come up with solutions and see how they work and then kind of later on figure out what are the problems that we can still kind of reshape and, and so on. I think we have had some lessons. This is not 19th century anymore. It's not early 20th century anymore. I hope we have learned something. Um, it's 21st century, by the way, yeah? Um, 
So um, I can stop here and just walk away. Um, but I would be a very bad engineer if I didn't just provide solutions yeah, or some kind of course of action. Um, or is this other, uh, so this is also, e this is e-mobility technology, it's a wall uh, next to the metro station, but it's ask it was asking for me, so Milos, what's the plan? I had to, and then I had to answer to the wall, yeah. Um, so I promise you this is the only graph, like don't run away, and, and you can change it, you can critique it, kill it, destroy it, it's an old dilemma that we sort of know, but it kind of, the, the answer is very simple, it's about learning about the past and anticipating more radical futures, basically, yeah? Um, simple things, yeah? Um, I'm kind of being ironic, yeah, if you're not getting that. So um, the, the graph is about this sort of the underlying dilemma that as over time, as time passes, we have a less and less flexibility in reshaping the path of technology. It's never zero at the end, yeah? We can still reshape many things. But think about the fact that uh, why are current cars the way they are? Why current roads the way they are? It's because of carriages and because of horses and because of some, some past stuff, yeah? Or that, my, my kind of this digging behind the history of that traffic signal control that was annoying me, by not working, I realized that this was originally a railroad technology. So then we copied something from the railroad and, and we kind of put it in the urban environment. And these are not exactly the same environments, if you think about them. I mean, I don't know, have you tried walking on a railroad? Um, don't, yeah? Um, so anyway, if you sort of if you accept the fact that technological flexibility is sort of reducing over time, and then on the other side, we're trying to learn about uh, technology as time passes, and we're sort of gaining more and more knowledge, I, I'm sure that maybe in the early um, 20th century, we couldn't really anticipate all these consequences of our mobility technologies, um, especially nowadays with sort of multiple crises of uh, you know, climate and well-being and democracy happening. But I think we should do better, yeah? So we should be on the green, this, this green line that we, we should start from a better point of knowledge uh, of some kind, yeah? So uh, that's why it's sort of in a sense about better learning and then anticipation at the end of the day. But then besides that, um, if we go back to that question of exclusion of people, we need to just change the way we think about this process of innovation. And here are the five basic democratic questions. I didn't invent them, people, much wiser people than me. I just read a lot and then ended up with finding these five democratic questions if, you, if you're wondering where to start. Yeah? And, and of course, for, for engineers, I think a friendly reminder to ask yourself this question, what is the problem? Because oftentimes I still see this sort of narrative of, I have a solution, but what is the problem? Yeah? So these are the five questions that I can uh, leave you with. Uh, and then of course, I can kind of tell you that we need actually innovation in everything around technology that you might sort of usually consider as technology. Uh, but maybe these are things also that we, I mean, we, can, we can discuss this later in the break. What, where is the boundary of technology? I, I love that question. But in a sense, a good systems um, engineer knows that in, you have to sort of intervene less in the system, but in innovative ways. So besides democratizing these processes, we need better foresight procedures, as you saw in the previous talk, better way to run pilots um, without kind of running into these, these kinds of uh, irresponsible actions, uh, as we have seen with self-driving vehicles or with electric scooters and so on. We need new kinds of policies. We need you know, to innovate in policies, not just obvious things like data protection, uh, but questions of IPR, if you change the, the kind of the innovation process and then the actual discrimination uh, that we have through technology. But most, most importantly, it's the, at least for me, it's this principles part. So that goes back to these values that we will have to deliberate about. Values like solidarity and dignity that I would sort of propose those texts have as opposed to sort of power and reason and determinism and competition and so on. Yeah. So besides answers, um, oops, I would be uh, also a bad professor if I didn't ask questions at the end, yeah? Uh, so I'll give you three questions. Um, here is one. So what if the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed? What if actually we have all the solutions like right now? We don't have to like invent Hyperloop or whatever else uh, Elon was trying to sell us. Um, that's one. 
The other one is um, what, and, and that's, that, I mean, that I have I've, I've used this word emerging technologies for so, so long that I've started wondering why are we even talking about this? Are we just maybe even distracting ourselves? So are we just actually, uh, are, are these actually just distracting us from readily available effective solutions like just better street design and better maintenance of, of things? Um, and then if I can leave you with the, with the third question, which is, this is not mine, it's actually, I'm, I'm actually proud that it comes from our students. Um, and I'll, if you allow me, I will read it out loud. Uh, perhaps there is a need for people to buy less, to travel less, and to find joy in living more humble lives. But who would dare demand this of the public? So with this question uh, of politics, what I can promise you that I will continu continue doing at Alto is that I will stay non-aligned. Um, but I, as in the spirit of responsible engineering, I will try to put society first, technology second. And um, that's all I have uh, for you today. Thank you.